All right, so thank you, Nate. And with that, we are moving right along here about halfway through the program. Two more presentations this afternoon for you. Um, ne next up on the docket is Ed Bloodnick with Premier Tech. Uh, Ed is here today to discuss how mycorrhizae and bacillus work alone and how together they become even more efficient and profitable in your growing operation. Really quickly, Ed is the director of the Grower Services team with Premier Tech, and he has been a team member there for over 30 years. Uh, the team there says that he is truly an industry resource that growers can rely on. His knowledge and passion are key in the development and refinement of all professional and retail pro-mix products. Uh, actually use some pro-mix myself at home for some of my vegetables in the backyard. So. Uh, with that, I will toss it over to Ed. Ed, we're ready for you. Um, take it away, sir. Okay. Uh, can you um, just want to see how I start up my uh, presentation here? Um, is it on You're the screen now? Loud and clear audio wise. Let's, okay. uh, let's check the visual. Take it away. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon uh, to everyone, Central East. Uh, good morning still to the, the West Coast. Uh, people joining. Um, I want to thank you to you know greenhouse management to uh, allow us to provide some a platform to share information for everyone. Um, the title of this is actually impact of uh, active ingredients on plants. Um, while uh, Premier Tech, uh, actually our company name is now Premier Tech Growers and Consumers. Um, the company name change was uh, effective um, earlier this this year, uh, but we were going by Premier Tech Horticulture for a long time. It, many people know us as that, but. More so, people know our products, Promix. Now, Promix, uh, I'll just give you a little history about Premier Tech. Let me do that first. Uh, again, my name is Ed Bloodnick. I'm the director of, of grower services for Premier. Um, Premier Tech Growers and Consumers, um, uh, Premier Tech Company, it's one of Premier Tech Companies. Premier Tech has been, um, is a 98-year-old company. Uh, Premier Tech has several business units, uh, including a Premier Tech Systems, which basically produces and manufactures packaging, palletizing equipment, blending systems uh, for different types of products. And it's not just I'm not just talking about horticulture here. This is also for other other industries. We also have another division, which is uh, Premier Tech Environment, which produces uh, on-site water treatment systems. Uh, the division I work is in Premier Tech Growers and Consumers, which produces um, in in our areas uh, growing media. But we also produce a number of consumer potting mixes and consumer products. Uh, and some of these products are are uh, ranging from grass seed to uh, potting mixes and sort for consumers. So um, as far as um, the section that I work in and my division, we produce growing media, enhanced growing media that goes into the edible, ornamental, and medical markets. Um, some of the consumer products also go into, you know, for, for home gardeners. So uh, Promix has been on the market for more than 50 years. And it's interesting, if you look, uh, I've been with the company, like I said, over 30 years, the evolution of the product. Uh, in the past, I've, I've been involved in uh, development of the products. And I still uh, involved in some of that as well, but the uh, today, but the, the products have evolved over the years. So what I want to do is first um, go through and explain some of uh, about the, the impact of how active ingredients, because this has been a key part of our business and how uh, it's, be uh, evolved to something different for growers over the years and gives them something uh, uh, val of value in their growing media. So it kind of differentiates our products from some of the other ones on the market. Just want to get this to advance. Okay. So what is what are active ingredients? Um, active ingredients are, are basically biological li living microorganisms such as bacteria or fungi, and um, they're byproducts as well. So these uh, these are used to enhance plant growth, reduce plant pathogens uh, that can cause plant disease or reduce insect populations. Uh, there's two basic categories. If I was to put them into something, I would say there's the biocontrols and there's also the biostimulants. Biocontrols uh, for insect suppression, they're uh, specific ones that uh, reduce insect populations. They don't um, eradicate insects. They basically reduce the populations. Uh, they do improve plant quality. I'd say the other key points would be uh, their preventative protection um, from uh, foliar or, or root pathogens. In, in the root zone, uh, they actually deplete the food source. Um, so for 
reduce exposure uh, to ex uh, chemical pesticides. This is a key thing for uh, using some of these biocontrols. Um, I should mention that biocontrols, once they mention something on there about any type of insect suppression or disease suppression, uh, these are EPA regulated products. So even though they may be natural or they're being produced and sold by companies, these are uh, required to be registered by EPA as, as a biopesticide. So uh, they, however, uh, they can be used with chemical controls as well, uh, which works very nice. And it's a very, uh, the fact that you can put these, it gives you another tool in your IPM uh, uh, bag of, of tricks to control insects and diseases. So if we look at biocontrols for plant disease, these are used to reduce incidence of foliar disease and root disease. Um, there's lots of different products on the market. I don't want to go through, I don't have all the time for that, but um, I do want to touch uh, more on the root disease uh, portion of it because that's our expertise and the areas that we've worked in and release products. Um, these types of products, again, are preventative protection. It slows the development of diseases. It can reduce uh, plant loss and improve the overall plant quality. Uh, bottom line that these things have to have a return on investment for growers. So these do save money. Um, there is an added uh, cost up front, but uh, it usually reduces the number of fungicide uh, chemical drenches that you would put on on crops. So uh, while it is you know preventative, it's something you you would add into in, in this case growing media, or if you you buy a type of product and you drench it yourself, um, this is something that you do have an upfront cost. But often because these things continue to work over time because they're living organisms and you're introducing to the to uh, you know the system or in you know for life on the foliage or on to the uh, into the growing media, this uh, does last longer. So it does uh, allow you to reduce some of your fungicide drenches in the case of the growing media. Um, there's also reduced exposure to chemical pesticides, which you know th this has become more and more of, of an issue uh, with growers and uh, in fact getting labor to work in these types of environments. So um, this is important as well. So uh, often uh, these products can be used in with chemical controls, as I mentioned. If you look at uh, biocontrols for plant disease, example of something that we produce is our product we labeled as, it's trademarked as biofungicide. Um, this product is a bacterium, it's Bacillus pumilus, PTB 180, um, and the PTB stands for Premier Tech Biotechnologies. Um, this is a, uh, the specific one, we actually isolated that and we produced that in large scale. Um, what's unique to all the, the ProMix products and the ingredients that we put in there, they're actually, um, in the case of the mycorrhizae and the biofungicide, and I'm coming to mycorrhizae, but these products are uh, produced at our facilities. So we don't buy them in and put them in, uh, allows us some better control uh, and more precision in the fact of putting those into our growing media products. So what's unique about the bacillus uh, pumilus is, and the fact that it forms a biofilm around the root system, it reduces the incidence of uh, root disease that's called caused by fusarium, uh, pythium, and rhizoctonia. It's also uh, known to suppress certain insects that pupate in the growing media, including fungus gnats and thrips. This is a recent um, development for us. We recently uh, applied to EPA for that, and it's now listed on our label. Uh, in fact, it's something that we found uh, in the case of fungus gnats, it reduces the uh, amount of, uh, of pathogenic fungi that the uh, fungus gnats would eat. So by suppressing that, it indirectly suppresses some of the fungus gnats. For thrips, we saw some reduction of thrips. Uh, however, uh, this, we need further research to really understand why this happens. We know that uh, thrips do, um, for an NSTAR in, in growing media, at some point there's a stage of their development, but they generally do not feed in growing media at the time that we know of. However, uh, we do know that there is some controls we found in our studies. Uh, this needs to be further development to find out the exact mode of action, why, but uh, we do, uh, know that it does suppress that. So we are listed for both these uh, types of insects uh, for suppression. Now we also look at some plants that are challenged with root pathogens. As I mentioned, um, the biofungicide works very effectively uh, and we're listed for uh, three types of pathogens uh, suppression. So that's Pythium, Rhizoctonia, and Fusarium. So here we see on the left here, some impatients uh, inoculated. These actually were challenged um, plants. So they were inoculated with Rhizoctonia but the Bacillus pumilus was incorporated into the growing media. So you have um, the uh, treated plants on the left, the untreated on the right. And on the right side, you have geranium that was inoculated 
um, as well. Um, and we, we see the bacillus pumilus incorporated in the growing media. So we see some differences in the, uh, the growth. Actually, uh, sorry, my pictures uh, should be turned, uh, quarter turned to the left. The larger uh, geraniums on the top are the uh, ones treated with bacillus. The ones at the bottom are actually the untreated. So what are some of the benefits? Well, uh, for these types of uh, active ingredients, there is a reduction of plant loss. Obviously, we're talking about suppression of uh, pathogens. If it's a suppression of, of insects, again, some of the insects are vectors um, for different types of plant disease. And of course, uh, a lot of plants are not uh, permitted to be sold at retail when they're infected with different types of insects. So um, you can reduce the amount of plant loss with some of these active ingredients. There's also some enhanced uh, crop uh, quality and uniformity. There's also some improved trans uh, transplant survival, uh, extended shelf life, because a lot of these uh, microbes will, will stay along with the plant uh, for life. So we see some extended shelf life at, at even retail stores. And uh, the last point here I have is faster uh, plant establishments. So we see faster growth and shorter crop time. So uh, these are some of the benefits. Um, again, the different active ingredients on the market, um, this is um, speaking in general, there's many different types of products on the market. Each of them are a little different in the mode of action, how they work. Uh, I mentioned earlier that some of them may actually produce some um, uh, byproducts that uh, help plants grow as a, uh, either by a stimulant or by suppressing certain types of insects. So you need to look at the different types of products, check the labels, clearly understand what they do and how they work. Um, Unlike uh, some of the chemistries, chemistry generally has a very broad um, treatment for different types of insects, where when we looking at some of these active ingredients, they're more limited in their scope of uh, effectiveness on different types of controls. So uh, important to know that. Uh, so as far as advantages, if we look at uh, in general, the category, they're safe to use. So it's minimal to no plant, human or animal uh, toxicity. Um, they're generally natural, they're discovered in the environment. So these uh, uh, active ingredients compete for space and food with pathogens. It's part of the normal checks and balances um, in a natural environment. There's also less uh, potential for pathogen resistance. Uh, unlike chemistries, um, you using a certain type of pesticide consistently, you can create superbugs. Um, there's less potential for this when you're, you're dealing with uh, these types of biologicals. Um, also listing with EPA, most have little to no REI, which is important if you're having employees work in that area, um, you want to be able to use the area or ship plants. So um, this is, a, is definitely a plus for some of these. Um, some are also listed with OMRI. So if you're uh, growing plants organically, um, this gives you another option. Uh, many chemistries may not be available to you um, with growing organic crops. So the fact that these are listed with OMRI, this is another plus. Um, these also can have continued plant protection for the retailer and the consumer. As I mentioned, some of these, because they're living organisms, they're uh, living on the root system of the plant, they can be carried on uh, with the life, through the life of the plant and the consumer uh, can benefit by that. So uh, that's a big plus. And also we know there's more of a drive of consumers asking for less chemical pesticides in from, ranging from foods to plants to different um, goods that they're buying in the stores. So this is uh, in line with consumer preference for less chemical pesticides. What are some of the consider considerations? Well, these are living organisms, so they do work differently than chemical pesticides. In the case of the root zone, the organisms are preventative, they're not curative. In other words, if you have an existing disease problem, you can't put, uh, or a pathogen that's there, you can't use these on there to effectively stop the, the pr progress of that disease. So these organisms are, are generally used as, as preventative actions uh, to keep, keep the onset of any type of, of a pathogen attack or, root or type of root disease. Um, they are also less effective with high pressure disease and insects. So if you have a situation where there's lots and lots of, of these pressures, um, they're natural and you know, they're organisms that are you know, like I said, living organisms. So they're um, more of a challenge for them to, to deal with high populations of disease or insects. There also could be some temperature and moisture restrictions. Some of these um, do not work very well. Um, 
our particular product in the case of the biofungicide is a bacteria. If you remember your basic biology, you know, fungi tend to be a little bit more fragile. Uh, bacteria is uh, more resilient and, you know, not talking about viruses, but we know viruses are very hard to kill. Um, in this case, um, some of the, the fungi may be uh, more susceptible to temperature change or higher low temperatures and even some of the moisture restrictions where they desiccate. Bacteria tend to be more resilient. So, um, it's one consideration. Um, there also may be some specific storage uh, requirements, just like uh, a storage the materials. Um, this isn't so much of a problem with our products because um, they're packaged in, in the, the growing media. The growing media, the peat and the other ingredients in there actually provide some buffering for it. Um, in the case of the biofungicide, we know we can go to high temperatures and freezing below, uh, well below freezing temperatures. Um, these products uh, work, uh, this type of biofungicide works very well in this product. So we don't have any uh, restriction for that. When we're dealing with some other types like mycorrhizae or things like uh, types of fungi, uh, they could be a little more fragile at the higher temperatures. Um, but in the case of mycorrhizae, which we also produce and incorporate in products, the mycorrhizae uh, are quite resilient. They, they work quite well and survivability is quite good at lower temperatures. When we get to high temperatures, um, I would say in the lower uh, part of the 48, where we see temperatures, you know, getting to 110, 115 degrees, obviously living organisms, if you're storing something outside in, in the full sun, it could be problematic. So you'd want to avoid something like that. Um, so uh, another key point here is uh, this does uh, provide an additional tool for your IPM program. So it just gives you another, like I said, another tool in your tool bag. So I mentioned something, uh, the biocontrols. Now we have biostimulants. The biostimulants are used primarily in the plant root zone. I don't know really of, of too many that are actually working on, on, the, on uh, the foliage of the plant or above root zone. So um, the microorganism actually attaches to plant root systems. Um, the types I said available are bacteria, fungi, and I put mycorrhizae as its own separate category. We have, we're hearing a lot more about mycorrhizae and use of those in greenhouses and nurseries. Uh, mycorrhizae is actually a symbiont, which is uh, actually a complex fungi. So I just put it in its own separate category. And um, as far as what do these do, they uh, provide enhanced plant growth. So we see some things like faster rooting, more developed root systems, uh, shorter crop time. And again, um, as far as compatibility, they're compatible with most uh, chemical controls, but check the label just to be sure. Obviously, if we're talking about a bacteria, you don't want to use a bactericide. Bactericides kill bacteria, so that's something you won't, uh, would, would not want to use. But some other things like hydrogen peroxide and some of the other products that are on the market, most of these uh, actually work quite well with that. They're not going to be harmed harm much by that, or if they do, um, some of the populations decrease, um, they will uh, rebound and come back up again. Um, so, uh, but most of the, the, like I said, the chemistries that are out there are, are compatible, but read the product label just to be sure. So if we look at uh, root stimulation uh, for the bacteria, again, I use this as an example. We see uh, some tomato seedlings here that just on a Petri dish with the uh, bacteria included in there. So we have the Bacillus pomalis. Uh, on the left here, uh, we see the seedlings and the root systems uh, growing, just normal seed germination. On the right, we see uh, the root hairs are, are much uh, uh, more dense, a lot more developed root system with the bacillus that's added. So again, this is just you know seed germinating with uh, the bacillus added to the Petri dish to see the difference on, on the growth of those seedlings. Um, I mentioned mycorrhizae. Uh, mycorrhizae, there are different types of categories. Um, I'm gonna mention two here, there are others. The two main categories are ectomycorrhizae, the, uh, which is ectotrophic mycorrhizae, they shorten it to ectomycorrhizae. Um, the other is endomycorrhizae, which is endotrophic mycorrhizae. Um, there are some differences between these and how they work and the associations that they form. Uh, ectomycorrhizae colonize many types of trees and shrubs. They're ideal for nurseries. Um, you see uh, more mycorrhizae development on things like conifers and some of the hardwood species, but they're really not for greenhouse type crops. So a uh, few, if any, will colonize uh, annuals, perennials, or vegetables. They won't harm plants, but there's really no benefit for those. Uh, in the case of endomycorrhizae, which we see more of those going into the greenhouse industry and, and what we include in our, our Promix product. Um, these colonize most herbaceous plants, um, annuals, perennials, vegetables, all those above included. There are some exceptions uh, on the vegetables 
for instance, cabbage, some of the, the uh, coal crops, some of those do not colonize. But for the most part, 80 to 85% of all plants will be colonized by endomycorrhizae. And um, this provides the most benefit for greenhouse growers, as well as um, they colonize a few types of trees and shrubs too. So they can be used for nursery. So things like uh, some maple, um, holly, some of the other types of crops for uh, nursery applications, they can be used there. So definitely one for uh, perennials. Uh, perennials, when they're grown outdoors, when they're subjected to the different types of uh, uh, weather system, you know, that might be depending where you're growing, um, mycorrhizae can actually benefit some of these plants. So let's look at um, just what endo endomycorrhizae do. It is a natural soil dwelling fungus. It's not a GM. GMO. It's not a genetically modified organism. The hyphae actually uh, grow from a spore and colonize roots and grow beyond the root system to increase the total absorptive area of the root. So basically, they become an extension of the plant root system. Um, the colonization takes, and we call we say colonization because they work together. Um, it colonizes uh, plants between three to six weeks. Some plants are faster than others. If it's a fast growing root system, we see a faster colonization. It, uh, something like a marigold that grows very quickly, um, you can see colonization with two weeks. Something that takes a little longer to grow in root systems might be slower in a poinsettia crop, let's say. It may be um, you know, four weeks before it really uh, becomes colonized you know, uh, throughout, throughout the root system. So what mycorrhizae, the endomycorrhizae do, they actually improve the acquisition uptake of specific nutrients, uh, phosphorus, copper, manganese, and zinc. It also gives uh, the plant access to water that might not be able, uh, the, the root system can't get by itself or unaided. So um, by the acquisition of these nutrients in the water, the plant um, in turn provides uh, carbohydrates to the mycorrhizae. So carbohydrates, starches, and some uh, limited protection from pathogens. Um, uh, it's more of a um, physical barrier more than uh, it's not something that it's producing something or attacking pathogens. So um, one of the other points, it reduces the effects of environmental stresses. So greater stress equals greater benefit from mycorrhizae. So um, if there's a system where there's a lot of stress in growing crops and weather's, weather's different or um, it's outdoors, like I mentioned with perennials, this is where mycorrhizae really benefit uh, crops and they shine. Um, it also minimizes nutrient deficiencies. So you see more uniformity throughout crops and it does, as I mentioned, benefit crops throughout the life cycle of that plant. So once it's on the plant, it's with the plant for life. Inoculum types uh, for mycorrhizae, uh, there are propagules, which are, um, they colonize plant roots that are, uh, are chopped up. So they'll take a, a root system from a plant and take parts, pieces, um, propagules, uh, can represent some hyphae, they could be spores, they could be live spores, dead spores, uh, can have some plant roots. And if the system was um, producing the type of mycorrhizae, if there's some root pathogens present, it can also propagate some of those in, in propagules. Guarantee wise, it's, it's questionable. Usually um, propagules are, are more broad, uh, explaining what type of uh, materials are in there. It's never uh, really pr so precise. You usually have really big numbers. When we talk about spores, spores are a little bit different. Um, analogous to seeds in, in plants, if you're looking at, at a plant, you have um, root systems, you have stems, you have leaves, you have flowers, you have the seeds. Um, just like with mycorrhizae, you have hyphae, you have arbuscules, you have vesicles, you have all these different parts, pieces, but the spores are much like the seeds in plants. So when you want to propagate a plant, one of the best ways to propagate is with a seed. When you're using mycorrhizae and use spores, spores are more likely to give you um, uh, rise to mycorrhizae and growth with plants. It's usually a higher quality and it's also better for long-term storage. When you're dealing with propagules, propagules can desiccate, may not uh, provide or, or uh, give rise to some of the mycorrhizae. So um, spores, as I said, analogous to seeds and plants, you're more likely to get mycorrhizae production from that. Um, as far as what we produce, we produce it aseptically. It's produced in a laboratory. Um, could it include pathogen spores? Extremely unlikely. It is an aseptic production that we have. Um, uh, one thing about the guarantees on spores, um, you should look at that not all spores are viable. In the products we're producing for mycorrhizae, those uh, spores are viable spores. We only do guarantee for viable spores because honestly, the dead ones, they don't really mean anything to us. So that's why we, we produce it that way. So some of the effects we can see here is active ingredients. Um, 
here's uh, some peppers that, you know, just in bedding trays, and we have untreated on the left, and then we have ones that are inoculated with endomycorrhizae on the right, both grown at the same time, same plant, it's all uh, a bell pepper, California wonder, and uh, grown side by side. And you can see some of the differences. The uh, plants are a little bit uh, larger. They're more advanced in the growth. Um, so we see some better growth with um, dendomycorrhizae. Uh, Here's some pansy. In this case, we included both uh, the biofungicide and the mycorrhizae together. The untreated on the left for the pansy, the treated on the right. Some other crops here, and there's lots of different crops. And I would suggest, um, if you wanna look at some of this, we have a lot of information on our website um, about different types of crops and performance uh, of the different active ingredients uh, for the ones we produce. Here we see um, on the left is uh, New Guinea patients. Again, plants the same time, differences, one's untreated, the one on the right is treated. Uh, in this case, we did both the, the Bacillus pomulus and the endomycorrhizae together. The uh, picture on the right, salvia, uh, untreated, and then the uh, Bacillus pomulus and the endomycorrhizae together on the right. And say something we find interesting with some types of, of uh, microorganisms and active ingredients is that uh, there could be uh, an association between uh, two different types of organisms and the plant itself. This is something what we call is a tripartite association. It's actually the biological interaction between the mycorrhizae bacteria and the plant itself. So if we look at this here, the plant uh, actually gives the carbohydrates to the fungi, mycorrhizae in this case. The hyphae from the mycorrhizae explore through the, the growing media or the soil um, and exude carbon. Uh, carbon is the trigger for mycorrhizae. Um, that carbon then, the bacteria absorb the carbon and multiply along the hyphae of the mycorrhizae. The bacteria in turn liberates lipopeptides and uh, or hormones uh, to help stimulate the plant growth, but also protect from the other pathogens, or if there is any pathogens in the root zone. So this results in protected and stimulated plant. Watching my time, we're supposed to be at 20 minutes here. so. Just to wrap up here, the summary here, there, there are a wide choice of active ingredients available for growers on the market. Um, in the past, I would say um, some years ago, had to be maybe a little bit more cautious, the different types of products. I would say that a lot of the um, federal, you know, EPA regulations, federal uh, regulations with USDA, and even the state regulations, we see a lot more controls and uh, there's a better understanding of the different types of uh, products that are on the market today. So I think uh, with that, there's a lot more um, controls and regulations for the products that go on the market uh, to be sure that uh, consumers are, you know, are getting quality products and, and for protection that the products do uh, fill up, fulfill the claim of what they, they're, uh, what they, they say they're going to do. So I'd say is um, each, each of the different types of products have specific applications um, they're, they're easy, easy to use in the past. They may have been more difficult, but some of the products now with the carriers and how they're applied, um, they're much easier for, for accessible to growers, but also easier to use and apply. Um, they definitely complement your IPM program. It gives you just another, they said another option, another tool in your tool bag. Um, again, check the label for applications, uh, just as with, you know, chemical, pesticides or, or other types of materials, read the labels just to be sure you understand what it is, how it works, and then you can determine how the benefit, how it's going to in, you know, work for you in your particular situation. Um, but overall, these they can be used to improve crop performance. Um, there's a lot of data that's out there now on it. There's been a lot of studies, not only uh, at university level, but at USDA, you can find a lot of information. I would suggest um, you know, for, for our, uh, our types of products, what we, we offer, um, if you go or have any questions, um, go to our website. You can look at uh, pthorticulture.com. You could also check with our salespeople or our grower services team. We'll be glad to answer any questions for you. Um, I would say go into our website because we have a lot of uh, information, uh, not only about our products, but also culture information to help growers, anything from nutrients to you name it, um, and helping uh, growers achieve better results. Uh, bottom line for our products, we want we want growers to get the best results. So um, some of it's explaining our product and some of the materials we and the ingredients that we have in it, so you understand that. But also, we also provide information support uh, so we can achieve the best results.
So at that point, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, just want to thank uh, Greenhouse Management for allowing us to uh, find this platform so we could uh, share information. All right, Ed, well, thank you as well for the uh, awesome presentation about these uh, really cool microbes that are uh, in your soil, helping you grow plants better, healthier plants. Um, have a couple questions for you from the audience. The first one is from an anonymous attendee. Um, this attendee says, many sales reps I have talked to emphasize reapplications of endomycorrhizae for longer cycle crops like tomatoes in the greenhouse. Um, does the beneficial fungus grow with the plant or do I actually have to reapply over and over? That's a great question. Um, you know, it really depends on the type of product um, that's available on the market. We know that there are some other mycorrhizal products that are on the market. Again, it goes back to, are they propagules or are they spores? What's the concentration? I know with some of the products that we offer now, we do a, an inoculum that's uh, called Connect that goes into the, uh, the medicinal market. Uh, in that case, that type of plant and how it's applied, we apply a higher rate uh, for that type of, for that mycorrhizae. It's the same, same uh, spore. It's the same, uh, you know, live inoculum that's going on those plants. And, but that type of plant is more responsive. So we, we apply a higher amount so that you can get some benefits from it. But um, what we're putting in our growing media is at a very high amount. Uh, for instance, a, a 3.8 bale, which is a common size uh, that everybody um, typically uses. And, that has over 30,000, um, you know, active live spores inside that, uh, you know, that bale. So that's a, that's a high count for mycorrhizae. So um, some products are better than others. Key is really to try them to see how well they work for you. Um, can they plants benefit? If you add more to it, in some crops, you could see some better benefits. In the case of tomatoes, uh, tomatoes are really responsive with mycorrhizae. Um, you may see a little bit better uh, if it's already in a growing media, as I mentioned with our product, uh, you may not have to apply it. Um, it does stay with the plant for, for life. I don't know if that answers your question, that. but this kind of led ifs and buts about it, you know, depending on which product you use. No, and a quick follow-up, Ed. Um, say, say you're watering your growing media to run off regularly. Will those mycorrhizae run off in, in that situation? Do you need to recharge? You know, a lot of them, the, the microbes that are applied, um, hang on to organic matter. I'm not saying that you can't find some that, that can leach from a pot or container, but um, they generally hold on to organic matter. Um, something like the bacteria, um, in the case of bacillus that we produce, bacillus, you know, when they, they uh, germinate from, from the bacteria and go and attach to the plants, uh, it only takes um, up to 48 hours. It's very quick. Mycorrhizae are a little bit slower to react. Um, it really depends on how many, you know, what kind of leakage is coming from the root system, basically the exudates and what type of carbohydrates are available to it. And that's really a signaling for mycorrhizae. So they can take a little bit longer, but typically these things hang on to organic matter. So if the growing media is, you know, based with peat or bark and other types of materials, whether it's, it's choir, um, they usually hang on there. It is possible to get some movement of it, but you're not going to lose large volumes. It's not like a, like a mineral, like fertilizer or something where you, you put some on and then you leach. Even, even for fertilizer, it's hard to get them all out if you leach a lot with just plain water. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, you probably would retain a very high amount in the growing media, so it's hard to leach it out of, out of growing media. I see another question here too. Um, how clean are these biostimulants and mycorrhizae? Do you test for coliform bacteria E. coli? Um, interesting is the, the mycorrhizae uh, and the, the biostimulants, our products, we test all of them. Ours are, in the case of the, the, uh, uh, the biofungicide, it is produced in vessel system. It's uh, produced from uh, stock material. It is tested on a regular basis for any types of contaminants. Same for mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae, it's, it's more specialized in how we produce it but they're all laboratory uh, produced. They're not you know, produced in a greenhouse or something. There are some products on the market, if they're produced from, you know, from capture or from, as I mentioned earlier, some plant material, they may use as host plants and they chop up the roots. It's more likely to be infected from something. So you do need to check for things like you know, any type of pathogens or um, harmful you know, coliforms or any type of uh, human pathogens, even for that matter. But um, for the most part, you know, in our products, we don't we don't see problems like that. We do test for it, but um, we don't we don't see problems like that. 
Excellent. Well, Ed, that uh, takes care of all the questions that we have today. Uh, such a fascinating aspect of uh, crop production, these microbes. Really always enjoy learning and hearing more about them. And uh, I'm sure growers will uh, always kind of have questions about these things. And uh, that's great that you and your, your company can be a resource for them on, on that side of it. So thank you, Ed. Thank, thank you, you. For Premier Tech for uh, your sponsorship, your commercial support for our conference uh, today. And uh, with that, we will move on to our final panelists.